Hey, Russ here with Stop Trafficking Project. A recent middle school assembly, a young girl came forward and revealed that her vulnerabilities were being exploited through social media. It was clear law enforcement needed to get involved, and they did. The very next day, they arrested the predator exploiting her, and they found that there were five other girls at the exact same school also being exploited. That man is now in jail on $1.3 million bond. The last student I spoke with at the final 2018 school assembly it was a 14 year old boy. He came to me at the end and he said, can you please help me? I'm addicted to porn. I can't study, I can't sleep, my grades are suffering. Can you please help me? What a joy to connect him with community partners that are giving him the assistance he needs. Your partnership is gonna help us go to the next level in 2019. Thank you, Rock KC, and all of you who participated in Run to Stop It. Your giving is literally gonna help us impact tens of thousands of students and adults. Thank you. Amen, thank you all that helped uh, participate, helped us to be able to write an $85,000 check to uh, the Stop Trafficking Project. Come on, praise be to God. The, uh, I, I'm so thankful that uh, God put us in touch with Russ Tuttle and, and the ministry that they're doing. And there's so many battlefronts to fight this whole thing on human trafficking. Uh, just uh, many fronts, legislative fronts. There's law, uh, enforcing laws, creating laws to help per perpetrators away. And, um, pre you know, going and, and speaking to children in these schools, you got to just hit it at all different levels. And we're so thankful that through um, your commitment to saying not here, not now, not ever. And we know that human um, enslavement is really what we're talking about in all forms. Uh, it's not just children. There are, there are adults being exploited. Um, and so we want to say no to all forms of slavery, right? I mean, it's like no one should have that much control over another human being. Uh, whether you're a pimp or, or whatever you are, it's just like not here, not now. And if, uh, you know, uh, Edmund Burke has been noted, quoted as saying, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And uh, we can't stick our head in the sand and just act like it's not happening. It is happening and we got to rise up. Some mama bears and papa bears and some sheep dogs have to rise up and, and say to those predators, you are, you no. And we've got to address the demand. And we know pornography feeds the demand. And, you know, it's, it's a 14-year-old boy addicted to pornography. Uh, folks, it is not like it was back in the 50s and 60s and 70s where you had no access to it, where you had to find a magazine that was thrown on the ground or something like that or find your dad's or grandpa's or whoever's you had. It is just a click away. Boom. And these predators are getting smart. They're doing it through game apps and everything else. And they're engaging these children uh, through games. And they're going on to those chat rooms. And they are, predators are predators. And they have one thing in mind. That's to fulfill their lust. And you, and you mix sexual desire, which is God-given, but it's a strong drive. And then you mix the love of money then you have the perfect formula for toxicity and evil. And that's what you have going on with this whole issue. Um, and where drugs have to get smuggled in and have to get grown and you have a process, when you can find a child or another human being, you've got a repeated drug that you can keep selling over and over again. And that's this hideous to me. It's, it's hideous. So you all know it's a passion. Uh, next year will be 10 years that we've done the run. Come on, 10 years. And uh, I'm thinking that we just, we go big. I'm thinking that we go big. And that since it's New Year's coming around and New Year's resolution, and I just want you to make a commitment to go big right now. Whatever you have done in the past, just double it for next year. So some of you don't double your zero. That's, that's, I don't mean that part, okay? No, but really, just let's go big. I think it'd be awesome. You know, we get it. Let's why not have like a thousand people uh, at the run? I mean, like a thousand in our choral things and just make a statement. 
Why not? I mean, really, you know, we had almost 2,000 people come through here uh, at three Christmas Eve services. So, and you all know somebody else that's not here right now. I mean, it could be easy. It's not that hard if we'll take the effort and make the commitment. And so then, you know, it is, and if we had a thousand people that would, I'm going to believe God for a thousand dollars, then we could raise a million in one year. Now, see, I mean, that's just how I think. I just, my mind just kind of goes there, you know, to believe God for big things. But I think 10 years, you know, go big or go home, right? And so just, I'm planting the seed. I'm just going to go ahead and cast a vision now. I'm not going to wait till, you know, a few months before October. Just go ahead and put it in your heart right now. Put it in your mind and just say, you know what? I ought to go ahead and do, I ought to walk a 5K. I've never done that before. I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to make plans right now to do it uh, or whatever your thing. Or I'm going to go down there and cheer someone on. And I'm just going to put it in my heart and my mind. I'm going to sit back and go, that's not for me. Okay, so I just go ahead and just come in and just lay hands on every one of you. You are like going to do this. Right? <laughs> you can feel it, right? It's like, hey, he's not making me do anything. It's like, no, I'm, I want to invite you to come along and get on this journey. And just think bigger for uh, 2019 and what God would want to do uh, through that. Last year was an amazing, two, I think we rounded up whatever was given to an even number, like 268,000 or, or something like that. All of that has been given away. All of it is out of our hands, out of the bank account. So to God be the glory. All right. Hey, on the prayer and fasting thing, I really want to encourage you. If you'll change your schedule, you'll change your life. Something does happen every year. I know, you know, some churches are doing 21 days. Some are doing 40. We're not in competition with that. It's not like you get extra points for being hyper-spiritual or whatever. It is like, it's like we're going to, we found a rhythm here that we feel like it's of God. And we're going to do that first week. 5.30 is kind of a sweet spot. You say, 5.30, how can that be sweet? It, it is. I mean... Something just happens, so I just want to encourage you again, if, you, if, you're, if you're tired of getting the same results, then do something a little different <laughs> and see what will happen. If you're able to come and join us, we'd love for you to be here. There's something about being here physically and present, and we just have times of worship and intercession, and um, fasting can be, you can fast food, you can fast, you know, whatever, fast social media. I, you pray about what you're to fast. The key is, is that just don't replace it and focus on what you're missing out on. Focus on God. So it's like, okay, I'm not going to watch my regular shows. So I'm going to spend that time in prayer, meditation, worship, intercession. And so don't just like, oh, I'm just doing without and I'm starving to death. It's like that, that defeats the purpose. Go ahead and eat. I mean, seriously, just don't get into legalistic bondage. But also don't let your flesh win out either. And... Um, and so you, there's a lot of different ways to fast. And people say, well, you know, I'm, a, I'm like, I, you know, I have a physical exerting job. I wouldn't recommend a whole lot of food fasting then. You know, go on a juice fast or something maybe. Because unless you just are led by God to do it. But the last thing we need you to do is passing out and knocking your head. And then, you know, blaming it on God because he called you on a fast. <laughs> it's like. All right, so anyway, have freedom in that and pray about it, and we'll try to have some stuff for you next week on, you know, ways for those of you that are new to it. All right. You all ready to get into the Word? Yes. Ready for that Word to get all up in your business? Yes. Okay. It's going to happen. I believe that it is. It does me every time I'm, uh, I read it. The Word convicts me and, and sharpens me and washes me and cleanses me. If you need a Bible, lift your hand or us just be glad to share one with you. If you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to keep that one as our gift. We really would love for you to take one um, and also encourage you to give it away. In fact, some of you are going to go to New Year's Eve parties. Why don't you take a Bible with you? Just carry it around like you do, you know, like we used to when we used to go to worship. Everyone would carry their Bible and, uh, well, all the spiritual people did. But, uh, you know, take that Bible with you, and then that'll help you behave, and then you might want to give to someone who's getting a little too drunk. Anyway, moving right along. <laughs> let's, let's pray. Father God, we love you. We praise you. Here we are, God, on this last uh, Sunday corporate worship of 2018, and we have made it. You are here with us. You've been with us the entire year through the ups and downs, through 
through the highs and lows, through the trials and temptations, you are the faithful and true God, and we say thank you. Thank you for all you are, all you do, all that you're going to do. And Father, now as we come to worship you again, we pray for grace upon grace to be poured out upon our hearts, to hear the word, to receive the word, to act upon the word, that the word may produce the fruit that you send it forth to produce in our lives, that fruit might remain. We would so prove to be your disciples and glorify you, our Father in heaven. We pray this grace to be upon us all in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Mark chapter 1. And Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat, at, sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. Now, let me just stop something. I love the fact that the scripture teaches us that in him and through him all things were created and there was nothing created except in him and through him. They were created for God's pleasure. So all creation was created for the pleasure of God. Everything. And so Jesus understood since he created the sound waves and he created all this that there's such a large crowd, they're not going to hear my voice if I stay here on the shore. But if I go out on the water... I've created this acoustic thing that happens, and the sound of my voice will travel off the water and onto the shore, and people will hear me more clearly. Isn't that neat? I and mean, that's a neat thing to, to do, and I think about, because if you've ever been out on a lake, or you've been on a shore, and someone's way out on a boat, and it's, it's a quiet evening, how many know you can hear them even, yeah, because of that acoustic thing? Well, God created that, and so Jesus sees this large crowd. He wants to make sure that they're all able uh, to hear. And so he goes out on a boat. And then he says, listen, listen. And whenever the scripture says listen, it means not just like hear, but listen. Like take heed, pay attention. I'm getting ready to say something that I want you to pay attention to. Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And so again, he's saying, okay, not everyone's going to hear this the way they need to hear it, but those who have a right heart, those who are hungering for, for, for truth, they're going to hear it. But those who are just kind of playing games, those who are just like here, they're present but not present. How many of you know that? I mean, you know, with the challenge we're having today in the world, present but not present, uh, the, uh, the social media thing that's happened, our technology thing that's happened, we already know scientifically uh, how dangerous it is for our young children to spend way too much time on, on devices because it's wiring their brain to uh, not be able to pay attention for long attention spans and constantly want to be stimulated. And there's a number of other negative things that are happening with that. And so uh, he says, uh, you've got to be present if you want to understand this. There has to be something going on inside of your heart. You can't just be going through the motions if you're going to get what I have to say. And so then when they were alone, verse 10, when he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables. They're like, hey, what, you know, could you give us some insight here? And he told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be he ever seeing, but never perceiving and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. I had professors like that in college who would not just feed me all the answers. They, they purposely made you search out the things. Like you'd go up and ask them questions and they would say, well, why don't you go and try to figure that out? They weren't just spoon feeding the answers. And man, those professors, you wanted to just like, Ugh. but then after you've done it, you appreciated them. 
because you realize they, they cause you to dig deeper. They cause you to do the research. They cause you to uh, go further. Like they would get up and say, hey, burden the proof's on you. They, they would just kind of taunt us in classes. I had theology classes that way, had some other classes that way, and they would just like, you know, burden of proof's on you guys. I'm here with PhD. If I'm wrong, prove me wrong. And they're like, yeah, challenge on, right? So some people melt under that. Well, that's not fair. You're not being nice. And others are like, challenge on, let's go. And make you, uh, un- what do you believe and why do you believe it? Do your homework. <laughs> you know, like, like do your homework. And so Jesus is just kind of purging out those who don't have a heart for this. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others like seed sown on rocky places hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When, the trouble, when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others like seed sown among thorns hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Otherwise, like seed sown, others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Now, Jesus taught in parables. He taught in stories. In fact, the scripture says that he he hardly ever taught without using a parable, without using a story, some kind of a metaphor, some kind of analogy from the natural to the spiritual to get the point across. And I want to do that this morning in my message, the last message of the year. I want to use a modern day parable. It has to uh, do with hunting. Well, actually not hunting. It has to do with animals. It has to do with deer. And I've got a little video that I have had edited down twice now to make it short so it doesn't freak too many people out. Now, what this, I'm not going to field dress a deer for you. I'm not going to show you how to do that. We're not going to have any blood. There's no gore. But it's a modern day parable that I want to, I want to teach from today. And what we're going to see is uh, some people that have come up on, a, on two bucks who are locked together. Their, their, their horns have been locked together. It's very common in nature for that to happen because um, bucks during uh, the pre-rut begin to, if you don't know what rut is, that's when female deers and male deers have their time of mating. And it's a chemical god created things so that they reproduce other deer and so they have the law of attraction happening and um, the the male dominated bucks get swollen up with their hormones and their necks get real big and and then the fights on and they're 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 fighting for the pre the dominance in the herd and what will happen is they lock their horns, they're fighting to see which one. And many of them sometimes end in death. Some of them get their eyes poked out. Some of them get their lungs punctured. Uh, and sometimes they get their horns locked together. They get locked up and they can't get free. And so this is what's happened. And one of the bucks is dead. And he's dragging this dead deer around. And the people come to rescue it. So let's watch it. It's exciting. I, I watched. It's four minutes, 35 seconds long. And we've cut it down to. I think you'd be pretty worn down already. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, happy ending. At least for one, I know, happy ending. And we, you know, but if you want to go back and hear the sawzall out going through the antler and, you know, just... It's like, it's not hurting the dead deer at all, but you can see it. But I spared that, spared all that for you. They say, Pastor, now why did you show us that? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> because we title, I'm going to title this message, Dead Weight. Dead Weight. Don't drag death into your future. We're closing out 2018. We're getting ready to go into 2019. Some of you are like, it's always a big deal. You know, January 1st is always the day, right? <laughs> it's always the new day, the new beginning. For some of you, it's just like another time, moment, whatever, to, to whichever. You know, if you have one day you esteem over another, God bless you. If you don't have any day you esteem higher than another, Paul says, God bless you. Just have, it, have the conviction in your heart. Don't be passing judgment on people who do these things. Just have faith in God. And, uh, but, but there's so many analogies that we can get from this. And I want to I wanna, I wanna try to flesh some of those out for us today. Let, so let's look at some lessons and questions from what we just watched in the scripture we read. What dead thing are you still dragging around? What, what dead thing are you still fighting and dragging around? It's producing nothing in you but frustration. It's producing nothing but bad fruit. But you're still dragging it around. Think about it. You got some habits. You got some practices that you're just still like that deer just stuck dragging it around so from the scripture here's some of the things that we we keep dragging around and what we've got to stop we've got to we got to break loose from we have to quit letting satan steal the word from us we got to quit letting satan steal the word from us i mean we hear a word we go that's for me Man, that was good. Man, that God was all over it. And before we hit the parking lot, it's gone. It's stolen. Something came and just stole it. We got offended at something. Somebody didn't respond to us right. Come on, how many know what I'm talking about? I mean, it's like, the, you, it's like it just got stolen. The, it just happened that quick. We got we to gotta stop that. We, gotta get, we have to get smart to these things and to his devices. And we have to... By the grace of God, say, you know what? That devil's not getting this word. He's not taking it from me. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm not letting him have this word. Number two, we must grow some roots and a backbone. Mark 4, 16 said, it, it, I'll read it to you again. Others like seed sown on rocky places hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. All right? It's like I, there's no root. You've got to grow up some roots. In other words, you've got to say, you know what? I'm going to, I can't, it's not all going to be easy. I can't just expect it all to be easy. I can't just expect the professor to feed me all the answers. I got to grow some roots down. I got to get a little investment in this. I, I've got to put some roots down. I got to become like that stubborn acorn who refused to give up its ground. If you see a mighty oak tree, then what you've seen is something that started out as a little acorn that just said, this is my spot of land and I'm going to keep my roots going down. And if you you rain on me, then it's just going to cause me to grow deeper. If you, if you snow on me, if you, if you hail on me, whatever you do, it doesn't matter. I'm going deeper so that I might come upward. That, that's all it is, is. It's a little acorn that refused to give up its ground. It's a, it's a, it's a seed that went in and said, I'm going to do what God created me to do. And, and we've got to We've got to decide, you know what, i got to grow some roots and I need to go down to the butcher and buy a backbone. 
<laughs> I loved I heard Dave Ramsey one time on the radio and he says you know you need to he told this guy he goes you know what you need to do because this guy called in and he had an excuse after excuse and he goes you know what you need to do you need to go down to the grocery store you go down and see the butcher and you need to buy yourself a backbone <laughs> you just like get yourself a backbone come on what what is this you're you know but but you got a little offended you got a little persecuted Come on, man. You said you, you went to fast for one day. One day, and you're already crying. I can't, I got a headache. I can't, oh my gosh, I'm so famished. I mean, come on. Get a backbone. Get some roots down here. But now I got to persecute. I just still, it was such joy at first. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to grow closer to Jesus. What happened? I had a big Mac attack. <laughs> a commercial came on. It's its fault, you know. It's like, it's their fault. <laughs> you know, if you're going to, not drag death into your future. You're going to have to cut the worries of life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things loose. Because you're entangled in it. You're, you're entangled in it. You're going to have to cut it loose. And, and, and make a decision that says, you know, wealth isn't bad. <clears throat> other things aren't bad. But they can become a deceitful distraction. They can become a deceitful distraction. Instead of just letting them come to you, they're, they're, you're going after them. Like, I'm going after this stuff. I want this stuff. Instead of just letting it come to you. It's called the worries of life. Where people just worry about everything. I mean, they're just worriers. They worry, worry, worry. They just worry about the weather. They worry about the economy, they worry about their jobs, they worry about their health, they worry about their children, they worry about their education, they worry about this worry, worry, the worries of life. And there are things in life that can cause you to worry if you dwell on it. I can worry about the clowns to the left of me and the jokers to the right. Here I am stuck in the middle with you. That's what I think about when that song it says, you know, you meet me in the middle, whatever. We just sing it's like, so that comes to my mind. I was like, <laughs> like, well, I'd be stuck in the middle with you, God. That's good. Okay. Clowns to the left of me, jokers to the right, and here I'm stuck in the middle with you. It's like worry. <laughs> Worries of life can come and choke the word out. Choke it out. Jesus, we know Jesus said, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry. I mean, go read and meditate and, and picture yourself sitting on that uh, uh, Galilean countryside and Jesus is sitting and he's teaching what we call the Beatitudes. And go and meditate on Matthew chapter 6 until it becomes part of you, until it's renewed your mind, until it's renewed your heart. And he tells you, look at the lilies of the field and look at the birds of the sky and they don't worry about their life. Why do you when I'll take care of you? See, I mean, you got to let this get in you and soak into you so that, because why? Because worries are going to come and choke that word. And then it says, the desire, the deceitfulness of wealth. If I just had more money, and that's people, the deceitfulness of what they think wealth is going to do. And they'll, they'll lose their family over it. They'll go to prison over it. They'll do all kinds of evil because of this deceitfulness of wealth. That like wealth is going to solve the world's problems. And wealth is going to do it all. And if I have wealth, then all my kids will behave. And if I have wealth, everyone will like me. And if I have wealth, we can have peace on earth. It's deceitful. It's deceitful. And then, then the desire for other things. How many of you like other things? Like, come on, you, you come on, you, you, you already have. How many pairs of shoes? 
you already have how many jackets to wear? How, how, how many fishing poles? How many lures? How many whatever? I mean, come on. And yet you can walk into stores needing none of that and go, ugh. I mean, like, for me, it's like other things, the, the, the desire for other things, just desire. And desire itself in itself is not bad, but you just can have desire for other things, and it can choke out the world. It's like, I got to work harder to get more of that that I don't use now, <laughs> you know? I mean, seriously, it's like, and I'm like, when's the last time I really wore those pair of shoes? And I bought them for $100, and I can go and get tan for them on eBay or at the second hand shop they'll give me that score I got 10 bucks no no you 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 spent 90 you wore them like three times I mean see other things can just like it can happen I mean, I, I, I'm confessing it can happen. I mean, I can walk into hardware stores. I can walk into motorbike shops. I can walk into classic car things. And like, I want like one of almost each, you know, it's like, where's my garage big enough to have this stuff? If we don't cut this stuff loose, we're going to drag death into our future. We're going to keep doing it. 1 John chapter 2, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the, uh, the, lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. For the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. See, this is going to be an ongoing battle. The lust of the eyes, that's just the, the desire for the, what your eyes see. I mean, just open your eyes. You see it. Now, look, you can't walk through life with your eyes closed. You've got to have them open. So you've got to learn to say, it's not all for me. I don't need all this. Everything I have need of, your hand has provided, God. I'm good. I'm content. See, it becomes a mindset. It becomes a heart set. It comes taking every thought captive. There's the, the lust of the flesh. It's just like, well, your flesh is just going to want stuff. Your flesh is want, it wants to be angry. Your flesh wants to be prideful. And that's the pride of life, where you're just going to assert yourself. Now, I was up early, early yesterday morning uh, in the cold, 18-degree cold weather with a little buddy heater in a blind before the sun came up and you have time to meditate and you have time to contemplate and pray that you know a good size deer will come by within shooting range but you also have time for some other things and and the Holy Spirit began to speak to me and he says you know Philip do not mistake weakness and willfulness. Do not mistake willfulness for weakness and weakness for willfulness. And you're like, and I'm like, I'm tuned in. I'm like, ah, okay, okay. Because here's what will happen. Every one of you have weaknesses. The Apostle Paul had a weakness, Romans chapter 7. He said, I, the thing I want to do, I don't do. The thing I find myself wanting to do, I don't do. The Romans chapter 7 goes into this battle of the flesh, this lust of the flesh, this thing, this weakness. And he says the only way to overcome it is by yielding to the Holy Spirit. That's the only way. You're not going to overcome it by will, willfulness and just determination. It's going to take something supernatural outside of yourself, something transcendent. That's the work of the Holy Spirit to come and help you lift yourself above this drag that's on you. But here's what will happen. You have a moment of weakness, and then you beat yourself up. You just beat yourself up. You condemn yourself because you had a moment of weakness. You slipped up. If you're not careful, though, you'll turn your moment of weakness into willfulness. And you'll begin to say, well, I'm just weak. I'm just weak. 
No, 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 no. Now you're willful. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> How many of you say, I'm just human. You can't expect me to be perfect. See, now all of a sudden you've taken a moment of weakness and because you're not breaking its power, you're not yielding to the higher power of the Holy Spirit. And now it's become a habit in your life. Now you're justifying your habit and now your weakness has now become a willfulness. And there's a huge difference. There's a huge difference between weakness and willfulness. You're all, we're all weak. And we're all willful. <laughs> and God is coming here to help you with your weakness, but he will not justify your willfulness. Say law. Ponder that. Meditate on that. That's what needs to get repented of. That's what needs to be broken free from. Is that willfulness. How do we produce a crop? How do we produce a crop? Hear the word. Accept the word. Act upon the word. That's how you do it. That's the only way you can do it. That's the only way I can do it. If we don't hear the word with a view to obey it, hear it, accept it, act upon it. That's it. There's no other way for you to produce fruit that remains that will glorify God and prove that you're a disciple. There's no other way. No other way. It's not going to happen any other way. This is another truth that we can learn. You and I need to be freed from dead works. Hebrews says, therefore let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Hebrews 9, but when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that have come, then through a greater and more perfect tent, that means his body, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, his resurrected body, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh how much more will the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God purify our consciences from everyone say it dead works to serve the living God what's a dead work any attempt to find favor earn acceptance or be made righteous before God by one's own effort ability or willpower that's what a dead work is. And some of us are trying to go into maturity and trying to be made right with God by our own dead work effort through our rituals. But they're producing no spiritual maturity. They're not changing us from the inside out. We're not more Christ-like. We're not more kind. But by God, we have our rituals. And by God, we do them every week. And we go through the motions. And they're a dead work. But they're not changing you. They're not changing me. They're, we're not more Christ-like. And we must get ourselves free from those dead works. What dead work are you tangled up in that is keeping you from freedom and maturity in Christ? That's a question. R.C. Sproul writes, The French philosopher Blaise Pascal is believed to have said there are only two kinds of people in the world. The righteous who understand themselves to be sinners and the sinners who believe themselves to be righteous. The Bible says that apart from God in Christ, all my righteousness is but a filthy rag, defiled and unclean, Isaiah 64, 6. Apart from the blood of Christ, my conscience and my hands are unclean, and my worship and works are dead. But in Christ, not only am I made alive, so are my works. Ephesians 4, 13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What dead things are you going through the motions through, but you're no closer to being more like Jesus than you were when you practiced them for the last 10 years? A dead work. It's a dead work. It's time to cut it loose. You know, here's another truth. Some battles you won't win alone. There are just some battles you're not going to win alone. That deer would end up dead. That deer would have ended up dead for two couple reasons. One, it would have exhausted itself and it wouldn't be able to eat 
because it's not freed from that dead thing or it became susceptible to predators when predators would watch it and begin to follow it and I guarantee you there have been wolves I think that was in Canada where that was taking place there have been wolves or coyotes that had been already marking that deer and watching it because they'd seen it before and they knew that there would be a moment it would get so exhausted and they would pounce on it and it would die it was going to die and when we are carrying around dead weight and things that we will not let go of, it's going to end up killing us. And there are just some battles you're not going to win alone. And your pride can keep you from getting the help that you need. Your pride. There are just some things that you're not some there are just some battles you will never win without humility confession and accountability they're not gonna happen you are not gonna get on an exercise program without some accountability and without some help you're just not gonna do it I don't care how many resolves you make in your head and your mind you know it you are not gonna do it until you get yourself committed to some accountability and your yes becomes your yes there are, some of you are not going to get out of debt and become a generous giver until you submit yourself to Dave Ramsey or someone like that who's got a plan that you can submit to and get on. It's just not going to happen. You're not going to get free from pornography. Some of you are never going to get free on your own. You're not going to do it. But pride keeps you from it. What help are you fighting? What help are you fighting and why? It's pride keeping you from that help. Number six, you must gain a new, not, new identity. If you're gonna, if you're gonna let go of dead weight, you must gain a new identity. And you say, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Here, here's the deal. You can fight something for so long that you don't know anything but that fight. And so you, so it's a psychological thing. It's like, well, the, if if they get well, then what am I gonna have? What, what am I really going to have? I, I won't have a reason for existence. It, it, it's, a, it's an ugly codependence thing that can happen. You can start out with good intention. And then all of a sudden now, your whole identity is wrapped up in their illness or their sickness or the thing you've been fighting. And here's the deal. That you, you've got to come into your new identity. You've got to say, look, that's who I once was. I am not that anymore. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. All things become new. Yes, God can use the battle to help free others. But listen, that's not me. My identity is not on what I was fighting. My identity is now who I am in Christ. I've got to discover that new identity. Yeah, God can use my story of the past, but my, ta my past is not me. I need you to stand with me. I've run out of time. Gosh, 2018 is ticking away. <laughs> at the same pace it always has been. <laughs> One second at a time. Bow your heads with me if you would, please. Are you here today and you're ready? to be cut loose from dead things, from dead religion, from dead works? Are you here today to be cut loose from the excuses of what the enemy did this and the enemy did that? And you know what? It's a focus on the enemy instead of a focus on God. Are you here today and you say, Pastor, I'm done with being uh, one foot in and one foot out, or I'm done with just willfulness and, and, and calling it a weakness, and I've got to repent of that, and I want to surrender my life to Jesus and I'm not going to wait till January 1 I'm not going to wait till tomorrow I'm going to get rid of it right here and right now and I want to surrender my life to Jesus and I want to let him take over and take control if that's you just lift your hand you say yes I'm going to I want to give my life to Jesus right here right now put your hands up over here that's it anyone else lift your hand up high let's pray this prayer pray it with me congregation let's come into agreement with those who have said in their heart yes to Jesus pray this dear Jesus I'm done with my sin with my excuses with my willfulness I want to be forgiven and I repent now I turn from my way and I turn to you Jesus 
I accept you. I receive you. I believe in you. Come into my life. Come into my heart. And from this moment on, forgive me of all my sins and live your resurrected life in me and through me by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Amen and amen. Can we give God a big hand for his goodness? To those of you that prayed that prayer from your heart, we welcome you to God's family because he has promised to as many as received him and gave the right to become a child of God. We welcome you to a journey of faith and a journey of following Jesus. And he's promised that if you'll draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. We have a book we'd love to put in your hand called A Fresh Start. If the ushers don't give you one, come by new here and I'll give you one. It'll help you with those steps that you can keep taking to draw near to God and God will draw near to you. How many of you are here today and you know that Holy Spirit spoke to you about some dead things that you've got to get cut loose from? Now some of you, it's going to take, it's going to require action. You're going to have to go ahead and submit to the help that's available to you. There are people who can help you. You know it. You know in your heart. It may be a counselor. It may be a program. It may be a ministry. It may be a system. There, it may be an accountability partner. But you know in your heart the help is there. But you refused it. But no more. you got to say, the dead things are going. I'm not dragging it into my future. I want to pray over you. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray your grace upon all those who have saying, yes, there are some dead things in my life that I need cut loose from and I need help. And I pray the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you. No more hiding in the darkness. No more being shameful about it. No more calling willfulness weakness. In the name of Jesus, I declare you free. I declare you th that you'll be helped. I declare that you'll receive grace even now to walk it out and you'll be changed from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give God a big hand for his goodness.